Who's a neuropsychologist? Just to go over that in general sense. Um, that's a very fancy scientific definition uh, of what a neuropsychologist is. But basically, a neuropsychologist is a uh, clinical psychologist who has special training in um, brain behavior relationships. So you think a typical uh, clinical psychologist might do testing for schooling or they might do testing for IQ or they might do uh, you know, psychotherapy. But we uh, specialize in looking at um, special tests to see how the brain is functioning and what the brain is able to do, which we're going to go over uh, now. So we do all pieces plus the brain behavior relationship. Okay, so there's certain tools of every trade. There's certain techniques that we all use, and I'm going to go over the basic things that a neuropsychologist might use to get the job done. First thing is intellectual assessment. Uh, most people, when they think, again, psychologists, they might think IQ tests. Everyone's thinking, you know, that's, a, that's a, one of the most well-known tests. And we do use an IQ test, which I'll talk about a little later, because uh, using an IQ test in rehabilitation is very different uh, than it would be if you're using it for the school setting where it was originally developed. Uh, we also do, this is a major part of what we do uh, when we're looking at any kind of neurological problem, that's the cognitive assessment. What we do as neuropsychologists, uh, which is a little different than some of the other uh, therapists, as you'll be hearing later, um, where the other therapists are often looking for functional abilities. We're actually looking at uh, more objective data of how the person's able to do compared to a normative population. So we give our test to thousands of people, and we get an idea of what the average person can do on a particular task. And then we see how far above or below a uh, particular person we're testing does on that task. Then we can give it a level of impairment or a level of ability. So that's, uh, we're going to go over that a little bit more later. Uh, of course, we look at personality, emotions, behaviors. Uh, and often these things interact. If you are uh, anxious, you're not going to be able to focus. If you can't focus, sometimes you start feeling anxious. So they start to work on each other. Uh, different personalities are going to respond to illness in different ways. Some people withdraw. Some people become very needy. Some people are not very comfortable being in a, in a uh, spot where they have to receive help. So all those different issues be, uh, we have to take in consideration. Now sometimes, because somebody is maybe depressed, anxious, fatigued, not processing well, gets overstimulated, there could be behavior issues. Be a little nasty, not want to go to therapy. Um, maybe say things that are inappropriate, all of a sudden your spouse is giving you a hard time and you used to be such an easygoing person. So we'll help develop different strategies for the team or for the family to work around those behaviors or uh, train up uh, more positive behavior. We also work together to develop cognitive remediation. How to, if there are problems with any of the thinking skills, memory, attention, reasoning, executive functioning, then um, you want to try to work around or fix those problems. So using our tests and our information will uh, help the team put those, those um, different strategies together and sometimes we'll actually work on those strategies ourselves. We sometimes as neuropsychologists get a little bit different feel because often we're working with the family in a counseling session and we see on in a more intimate way all the different aspects of the family uh, and how that uh, cognitive difficulty starts to play out and then we can give some suggestions of different remediation or sometimes then communicate with a therapist. This is what we're seeing is happening in therapy that's causing concern. Any ideas? And of course, uh, all our patients with the stress that you're going through with any kind of illness, um, could, you know, it's often depression, it could be anxiety, uh, just being uh, tense, irritable, upset with all the different things that you're dealing with. And some people uh, have a history of depression or anxiety even before, and then you add the stressor into it, and now that could really uh, make that depression that much worse. So uh, giving counseling services, helping the family cope is a hugely important part of what we do. And you want to, uh, it's important that you don't automatically assume that the depression is because of depression, because sometimes what the family would say is depression isn't a depression at all. It's just that the person is fatigued or the person's not focusing well, or sometimes the person just isn't initiating because there's some issue with the frontal lobe and, and it's that initiation problem, not depression. We gotta help educate the family and tease that all out. All right, a little bit about IQ. Um, this is the most well-known uh, test right there. It's the uh, Wessler Adult Intelligence Scale. Uh, we're up to the four. They upgrade the test every couple years. We have to buy a new one, I think. Uh, but that's the uh, one we're uh, using now. Now, in rehab, the IQ really is a meaningless number. Everyone wants to know, what's my IQ? And it, it's not an important number because there might be certain areas of the brain that have been affected um, by the tumor or whatever the injury is that's causing 
a, a, a particular area of cognitive functioning to be impaired, which is going to affect the overall IQ. The IQ is just a summary of a whole bunch of different test scores. So to just average those test scores out and say, here's your IQ, that doesn't make any sense. So that's not really what we're looking for in most cases. Sometimes if it's a student uh, and you want to go back to school, the IQ will be important because it gives an idea of academic potential, but we've got to keep that in mind that it may not be an accurate number. It may underestimate the person's actual IQ. All right. The IQ is broken into, I'm going to get these all out here. Um, the IQ is broken into a lot of different parts, and this is what we're more interested in. When we do an IQ test, there's one part that looks at verbal knowledge, verbal, uh, it's called the verbal comprehension, but it's what do you know, what have you learned over time uh, through the auditory channels? Um, vocabulary, facts about life, like how, who, different presidents or uh, who Albert Einstein was, and also reasoning with words. And these types of skills um, are important for us because uh, often, if the language areas of the brains haven't been affected, they're very resistant to brain injury because it's old knowledge. It's what we call crystallized intelligence. It's in your brain. It stays there. Um, often with dementia or Alzheimer's, it's the last thing that you'll start seeing decline. Whereas the perceptual organization index, now we're looking at nonverbal reasoning. It's more of a uh, um, new, new information. It's more novel. It's what we call fluid intelligence. And it has more to do with things that you see spatially or putting blocks together, or uh, you'll see a, f a figure and have to figure out which piece is missing, things like that. And often they're more time, so you your processing speeds involved. Working memory is, we, is, has to do with hearing information, holding on to it, and spinning it back out. So repeating numbers forward and backwards. Now that is often affected by any kind of neurological problem. It's affected by fatigue and it's affected by anxiety. It's a very sensitive measure. So uh, we've got to try to tease out what might be causing the problems there. Uh, if you're very anxious about being tested, that will often be uh, reflected in that working memory. The processing speed score, um, again, is a very, probably the most sensitive measure we have in any kind of neurological problem. And that's taking simple visual information and doing something with it very quickly. So it involves psychomotor speed, quick visual processing, and any kind of times you have anything happen to the brain, it's going to uh, impact the way it works together as a whole so there'll be a, it'll be slowed down sort of like some roadblocks in the major highways and we'll pick it up on the processing speed index